Okay, and welcome. So today we're going to be talking about chapter six, which is an endogenous growth model with human capital. So in the last chapter, the last model that we looked at, we had a production function that allowed for human capital spillovers, but we didn't actually have any human capital investment. The human capital investment kind of fell just into like the, the capital term for investment in the investment equation or the law of motion of capital. Now what we're going to be doing is instead of having that difference in the exponent for the production function, we're going to have a typical, well, semi-typical production function that is constant returns to scale, only now, instead of having that different exponent, we're going to have another input in the production function, which is human capital, and we're also going to include human capital in the actual like, investment equation. So we're endogenizing growth by allowing for human capital investment just that much more. So without further ado, let's get started. Now the model really isn't going to be all that terribly different than what we've seen before, right? I mean, really all these are just tweaks on the neoclassical growth model. So, you know, we take the neoclassical growth model, add a little bit to it, you know, add a little term here, add this thing to the constraint. You can add a little bit more into the objective function if you wanted to. But the neoclassical growth model, sort of like the workhorse like model, just for dynamic general equilibrium models, and well, eh, no pun intended, general. So here we go. The utility function is exactly what we've seen before. Obviously not with that marker though. So we still have an infinite horizon, we still have log utility, we still have the exponential discounting weights beta. So far everything's the same. Now take a little bit of a deep breath because this is where it's going to change just a, just a little bit. And by the way, this is also the last dynamic general equilibrium model that you will be responsible for knowing how to actually differentiate. Uh, the exam, which will be posted up next week, is going to have one of these models. So you will either have the neoclassical growth model, the endogenous growth model with like perpetual growth, or you will have the endogenous growth model with human capital investment. One of those three will show up on the exam. Anyways, output. So remember we want a max consumption, max CT, and we want to do so subject to a number of constraints. Well, one constraint we're going to look at is output. Now, if I just kept it like this, wouldn't really look that different than the neoclassical growth model's production function. But there is something else that we're adding in. We're adding in human capital. Now, I want to go ahead and say human capital is not the same as labor. Like in the solo growth model, we saw A to the alpha times, or A times K to the alpha times L to the one minus alpha, right? Here, what we've got isn't labor. HT is not labor because this is still per capita, right? This is still the household at like the individual level. So everything is already just done in like per capita terms. Now, Human capital is not the same thing as labor, right? We can think of labor as like the quantity of hours or the quantity of labor, the quantity of work put into producing stuff. HT is a little different. HT is more like the quality of labor. So with like what we had in the last model where we had production in terms of like physical and human capital where that was just sort of all like kind of put into that K term, here we're separating it out. So I've got physical capital, just straight up physical capital, and then I've got human capital. 
So what is human capital? Well, like I said, it's sort of the quality of labor, but what makes the, the quality of labor a little bit more important? Like why are we interested in the quality of labor besides just the quantity of labor? Well, one reason could be that as firms decide they want to invest stuff, well, they can invest in physical capital, but I'm sure you've probably heard about jobs now that, you know, if you get a job with an undergraduate degree, they'll pay for you to go and get your master's, right? You could think of that as like human capital investment. You could also think of your decision to go to school, right? Your decision to take this class is in fact a form of human capital investment. You are investing in your own human capital. So what you're doing or what happens with this human capital term is it's really kind of like a measure for like knowledge, right? How knowledgeable is the labor force? How much knowledge is going into producing this stuff in the economy? Oh, excuse me. Ah, that minor, um, uh, we will say release of uh, error. I can't think of a fancy way to say burp. Uh, brought to you by Waterloo Sparkling Water. They're probably not going to give me a plug for this. I'm probably not going to get an endorsement or anything, but it'd be nice if I did. So we've got human capital, which accounts for knowledge, right? It's the, the knowledge, like the stock of knowledge in the economy. So that part's good. We're all right there. Now, our resource constraint is exactly the same thing as before. So we've got y equals c plus i. So again, there's no government. There's no trade. Closed economy, no need for a government. Why is there no need for a government? Well, number of reasons, but uh, the first and second welfare theorems are met, meaning that there's really no need for any sort of like redistribution going on, right? There's no need for a government to exist because, well, everything's already perfect as it is. Now, here's where things get a little different. So they got different in the production function. Now, consumption, well, that's just the same. You're still just consuming stuff. But investment, investment's going to change. Here's what I got for investment. Now I'm not allowing for any depreciation of physical capital. So what I'm assuming here is that there is no depreciation of capital. So if you don't see that one minus delta in front of the KT, that just means there's no depreciation. But here's another thing that's interesting though, right? And I, I left the one minus delta out just to kind of keep things somewhat simple for you. And don't worry, I'm not gonna like give you the exam where there's a one minus delta in front of this. That's, that, that would be mean. If you haven't seen it on the board explicitly, then well, you're not gonna get it on the exam. So basically we can either buy physical capital Let's say we can invest by buying physical capital, which is KT plus one, just like what we saw before. But there is another thing that we can invest in human capital. HT plus one. Now, the interesting thing about this though is that, so the, there's no depreciation in the capital stock, right? So whatever capital we had yesterday, just sort of just added, we just add more stuff to the capital today. But there's also 
no depreciation in human capital. And if I wanted to make this a little more difficult, right, I'd have that one minus delta in front of the KT there. But even if I did that, there wouldn't be anything for the human capital stuff. There would be no depreciation for human capital because human capital itself doesn't depreciate, right? Stuff can fall apart. Stuff erodes over time, right? Like, uh, like I said, tires on trucks fall apart. Uh, tubes for guitar amplifiers fall apart. But human capital, ideas, knowledge, that actually just builds. It never depreciates because once you come up with calculus, right? Like, so Isaac Newton, right? You know, a lot of the stuff that he did with calculus was really like the, uh, the stuff with the derivative. But then, you know, we figure out differentiation. Some guys do a little bit more work with integration, right? So the integral rather than, the uh, rather than the derivative, right? You get the Riemann sum. Well, the Riemann sum was developed because of all the stuff that Newton did. So it's not like the stuff that Newton did just got forgotten by everybody. It's actually the opposite. Everybody remembered it because it went books. Right? And if people didn't remember it, they could just go read the book and then, oh, boom, hey, guess what? Cool. I remember this stuff now. It's kind of how it works. So the human capital, the knowledge base, is constantly growing. It's never falling apart. There's never human capital that we forget that we have to try to replace by, like, reinventing the wheel. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. The wheel's already been invented. Right? The Like, this stuff that we're learning here. I don't have to... Every single time I set up a dynamic general equilibrium model with an infinite horizon that I solve via dynamic programming, I don't need to prove the existence of the Bellman equation. I don't need to prove any of the recursive properties. I don't have to prove the balzano weierstrass theorem for any of this stuff because it's already been proven. And as long as, mathematically speaking, this stuff meets the criteria of those things that I was talking about, well, why prove it? It's already been proven. You can just say it can be shown this if anybody ever really asks, but nobody really will because it's, well, like I said, already been shown, right? If you want to, you know, build a car, for example, well, you may have to do a little research and, you know, exactly how to make the car, how to build the engine, all that stuff. But the nice thing about that is, well, it's already there, right? You don't have to go, hmm, how am I going to build a I'm going to build an engine like that's already been done the internal combustion engine was invented a long time ago so you don't have to worry about that instead you're going to worry more about how you're going to improve the engine right like how your product your car is going to be different right if you want to make a guitar amplifier you want to make a cool new tube amp right you're gonna to have to find a way that your amp is going to be different than you know if you're into like rock and metal stuff like i am why it's going to be different than a PV5150, a Mesa triple rack, a uh, you know a rev generator 120, any of those, right? You're going to have to come up with a reason why it's different. You're going to have to make it different. That's where the human capital investment stuff comes in, learning how to do that. Because the more you learn about that, the easier it gets to be able to produce this stuff. So that's why a lot of firms will pay for you to go to school. You know, you get hired on with a bachelor's degree, they want you to have a master's, well, the company will pay for you to get the master's. That's part of the human capital investment. It's sort of a, you can think of it kind of as like a research and development, like an R&D type thing, right? Because as they do R&D, they learn new things and that builds on what they already have. So there's no depreciation of human capital. Now there are ideas that don't work. There are ideas that we thought worked that you know, didn't really hold up so well over time. But that's not so much like a depreciation of ideas. It's still building on the knowledge base because now we go, hmm, yep, yeah, that didn't work. Let's try this instead. So that's sort of what is going on there. And as such, now we can either buy physical capital or we can buy human capital. So we can say that human capital just flat out does not depreciate. Now in this model, physical capital doesn't depreciate either, but that was just kind of a, we'll, we'll call it a simplifying assumption to make things a little bit easier on you because, well, I don't want to make things really, really hard. 
especially when we're already doing fairly difficult material. I don't need to make it worse on you. That'd be kind of a, a shitty move on my part. So let's do what we did before, right? So we have to do stuff to combine the constraints. Because, well, we've got three constraints right now. It'd be nicer to just boil it down to one. So let's boil it down to one constraint. Well, okay, cool. I'll plug this in for Y. Actually, I needed a different marker entirely. Let's see, what did I use them for? Seems like a reddish purple. Purple works. So to combine the constraints, I'm going to plug this in for Y, and I'm going to plug this in for I. So this is my constraint. So as you can see, it's really not all that different. Right? There's nothing that's that substantially different than what we saw in the neoclassical growth model. Only now we just have a different term in the production function and a different thing that's being put into the flow investment constraint. So now, production is a function of physical capital, right, stuff, and ideas, human capital. And as such, we can invest in physical stuff, or we can invest in ideas. Now, the physical stuff will definitely help make ideas easier to implement, right? That's why there's going to be, there's like a multiplicative thing going on here. So there's like an elasticity of substitution between the two. Don't worry about trying to find any of that stuff. I'm not gonna make you do that. But there is an elasticity of substitution between physical and human capital. Because as you get more stuff, like this physical stuff, it makes it easier to implement these ideas, right? If you've got a bunch of computers and you hire a bunch of computer programmers, it's probably gonna make it easier for them to do computer programming. If you've got a bunch of really bad computers or no computers at all and you hire a computer programmer, they're gonna get really bored and eventually leave to go find work where they can do computer programming stuff or they'll do absolutely nothing for you and just you know sit on a nice fat salary of you know hundred plus thousand dollars a year um, I mean I can't exactly knock that line of thinking but I'm getting a little off topic here so there's physical stuff and there's ideas and there's like an optimal combination of physical stuff and ideas that will optimize production optimize output, optimize income, and therefore in doing so, as we're optimizing this, obviously we have to optimize our investment because we have to figure out how much of this stuff we want to have. So if we optimize investment in production, well then we're optimizing consumption, right? Walras law. So again, we just formulate the Bellman equation accordingly. Actually, before I formulate the Bellman equation, I'll just do one nice other little thing, pretty quick. We'll solve this for C. All right, we'll solve for consumption. So what do we get when we do that? Well, we just get this equals this minus this. Consumption equals output minus investment. So the output. this minus this stuff. So it's minus KT plus one plus KT minus HT plus one plus HT. And we get that. So this is the constraint solved out for CT. Now, this is where I will also say that capital, physical capital is a state variable, right? It's something that can't be chosen today to put into the production function because that was chosen yesterday. Well, the same thing holds for human capital. Human capital can't be chosen today. Like the HT in the production function, the, that was chosen yesterday. So HT plus one can be chosen just like KT plus one. HT and KT, on the other hand, are the same because they can't be chosen today. They were already decided yesterday. Oh, excuse me. So. 
In doing so, remember the Bellman equation. Initially, it was just V of KT, right? Because we only had capital to worry about. Capital was the only thing that we were maximizing in this. But now that's not exactly the case because there's not just capital that we're interested in investing in. There's also human capital. So we have this, KT and HD, physical and human capital. So we're maximizing this function with respect to physical capital and human capital. If we can choose those two optimally, then we can optimize output, Y, and because I and Y, investment and output, have been optimized, well then, by Walras law, C also has to be optimized. So we're gonna have a natural logarithm of what was supposed to be consumption, right, just CT, but we substitute this stuff in for CT instead, just like we did with the neoclassical growth model. and for the constraint. senior moment, but I don't like to think I'm old enough to have a senior moment yet. So because we've got V of KT and HT, we're also going to have V of KT plus 1 and HT plus 1. So really, in all reality, this isn't too terribly different than what we saw with the neoclassical growth model. have a different term or another term in there that is going to be part of the optimization process. So this is the Bellman equation that we'll be setting up and what I'm going to do is I'm going to end it here. Yes, I will end it here. So this will be the end of this particular lecture. There will be another one that comes up that deals with the actual optimization, right? So here we just set the model up. The next video, the next topic, is going to be how we optimize the stuff. And then the topic after that will be some of the intuition involved. So be on the lookout for that because it will probably actually be posted at the exact same time this gets posted. So yeah, enjoy. Thanks. And until next time on Macro on NyQuil or something. <laughs>